this is the last um, this last uh, um, lecture of the season. That is the last World Affairs luncheon for the season. And I only had to just tap this, and everybody was quiet. So I hope we start that way, in that in that way, in the beginning of next semester. Anyway, uh, I've known today's speaker for a number of years, so I was. I was shocked to realize what a challenge it would be to introduce him today. I was reminded of the wisdom of an Oberlin art historian, Ellen Johnson, when asked once by a student to de des describe Picasso. Her reply, you can't pin him down, he's not a dead butterfly. <laughs> well, David Levering Lewis is, uh, fits that description too. He is without question not a dead butterfly. <laughs> He has been described as a comparative historian, but I see him as an historian with enormous curiosity about the world, not limited by century, nor continent, nor viewpoint. He wrote the first academic biography of Martin Luther King Jr., published in 1970, Prisoner of Honor, the Dreyfus Affair in 1974. His two-volume biography of W.E.B. Du Bois were published in 1994 and 2001, both volumes winning Pulitzer Prizes. Turning his attention to Islam, he published God's Crucible, Islam and the Making of Europe in 2008, and his most recent book, soon to be out, is The Implausible Wendell Wilkie. David Levering Lewis is hardly a dilettante, he is, he is instantly, insatiably curious and uh, takes each new subject with depth and eloquence. He is indeed a virtuoso. Dr. Lewis has taught in a number of institutions, including the University of Ghana, Morgan State, Notre Dame, Howard, the University of District of Columbia, and Rutgers. Most recently, he served as the Julius Silver University Professor and Professor of History at New York University, from which he retired recently. He served on numerous boards and is a member of such prestigious scholarly organizations as the National Humanities Center, the American Philosophical Society, founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743, and Phi Beta Kappa. Please welcome him to the podium. Well, it's very good to be here. Uh, I thought I could take the train, uh, but I found that <laughs> although Stratton is a famous railway hub, uh, one has to come by either one's own car or trailways. But in any case, it's very good to be with you. Um, <clears throat> I wrote the, the book that uh, uh, brings me here. Uh, now it's uh, seven years old, and so much has happened. Uh, since uh, its publication in 2008, that I, I have had occasion, especially quite recently, to ask myself, what was I thinking when I wrote a book about the convivencia, the collaboration of uh, two civilizations, two cultures, two uh, political arrangements on the Iberian Peninsula, uh, which uh, I argue uh, exemplified a kind of proto-modernity and pluralism, which was a very fine and exemplary thing to remember and appreciate, and whose influence upon us is uh, still with us. But you wouldn't think so, uh, thinking of Paris today, or thinking of uh, the various creations that have come from the destabilization of the Fertile Crescent, a destabilization which, fair to say, we are representative of the malefactors who have caused that destabilization. Um, and so, in, my, in our present geopolitical climate, uh, 14 years after September 11, 2001, I have asked myself uh, what I was trying to get at with the presumptuous and problematic rationale of writing God's Crucible, Islam, and the Making of Europe, 570 to 12, 15. 
And I had just deleted uh, a, a few lines uh, from my prepared uh, remarks until uh, I was uh, presented as a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I proposed to include them, in fact. Uh, I was greatly reassured to find my rationale captured to the point of justification in S. Frederick Starr's lost enlightenment, Central Asia's golden age from the Arab conquest to Tamerlane, his accessible 2013 survey of the Muslim world from the 7th uh, to the 15th century, uh, sort of the same chronology uh, that uh, I have uh, enterprised. I quote, uh, and he was the emeritus professor, uh, president of Oberlin, by the way, it's so another match, uh, Starr's preface, his preface. He says, my book was written not because I had any particular knowledge of the many subjects and fields it touches upon, but because I myself wanted to read such a book. <laughs> well, that is real chutzpah, isn't it? <laughs> uh, S. Uh, Frederick Starr, uh, adds, as I would, of my contribution, that no such book existed at the time. And the idea for my book germinated three decades ago in Khartoum. My time in the Sudanese capital, just shy of a month, <clears throat> was spent reading old British army intelligence files on the activities of Muslim fundamentalists who had stopped the African, East African advance of the British uh, Empire uh, for the better part of a decade after 1885. <clears throat> to Victorian England's astonishment, uh, the ragged dervishes of uh, the Messenger of Allah, Al-Mahdi, and the successor, Al-Khalifa, had held the world's mightiest empire at bay. The history of the Sudan's Mahdiya regime comprised a large part of the race to Fashoda, European colonialism and African resistance in the scramble for Africa, uh, my 1989 book written partly uh, from my rewarding uh, cartoon sojourn of 1982. And four years later, the secular republic of the Sudan vanished after Sunni extremists led by the ideological descendants of the Mahdists came to power. There had been a definite indication of, uh, of what was in store for the republic soon after I left Khartoum. On September 8th, 1983, one year to the day of my return, from Africa and in violation of the country's 10-year-old constitution. An embattled government <clears throat> courted the support of Islamic fundamentalists by attempting to impose Sharia upon a national population geographically and ethnically divided between Muslims in the north and animists and Christians in the south. As years passed, the cautionary experience of having observed the power and appeal of Islamic fundamentalism in Khartoum, even if only uh, from my lateral vision, registered with a growing insistence. All the more so as it came to seem reasonably certain that the supreme modernizing empire of the 20th century, the United States, was sleepwalking on a collision course with Islam, similar to Great Britain's at the end of the 19th century. And the logic of that costly confrontation seemed transparent to me as, a ser as the serial <clears throat> assaults on the symbols and instruments of American power unfolded in the Middle East and East Africa during the 1990s. We remember the assaults upon the two embassies and the attack, the first attack upon the towers. For a historian, thinking about the present means thinking about the past in the present. To know something of Islam's remarkable 700 year presence in Europe is to contemplate a slice of history that might seem to have little or no place in the post-modern present. Indeed, much of the Muslim world 
stands in relationship to Europe and the United States today as much of a ramshackle Christian world once stood in relationship to a highly advanced Islamdom. In the upending of this fraught history are many of the causes for the troubled history being made in the 21st century. How well my book <clears throat> succeeded was brought home to me by an unsolicited invitation from an Egyptian scholar to accept an online interview in October 2012. Uh, I agreed, found the Egyptian scholar Abdur Rahman Abu al majd intellectually engaging, but eventually I forgot about the experience. The Arab Spring swept out of Tunisia across most of the Fertile Crescent. Mohammed Morsi of the Muslim brother, Brotherhood came and went. Uh, his movement officially pronounced, uh, proscribed by the Egyptian High Court in September 2013. The restoration of military rule was finalized at the close of 2013. On March 8th of this year, Abdur Rahman, apologizing for the long delay, emailed his edited interview of my answers to his questions. Dear David Levering Lewis, I have just finished preparing the interview. I wish it were good. Here is the edited version. You can arrange any few typos, you can change any few typos and other minor items and add what you want. What a great thinker, David Lewis. You may be invited to come and give some lectures in Arab, Arabic centers for culture. I'll do my best. Name your price. <laughs> no doubt readers will enjoy much a great interview. I have attached the interview. Best regards, Abdur Rahman. Well, I thought this is interesting uh, and perhaps it would lead to a greater uh, currency of, of this book in the Uma. It has been translated into a number of languages, but not Arabic, into Turkish and into Spanish and into Indonesian and into Korean, but not yet Arabic. But I wondered what was all this about, and so I asked a couple of uh, uh, former, uh, or I asked a uh, Columbia a colleague, Hisham Aidi who has had some success in writing about the cultural influence today of, uh, of, uh, of Islam in various uh, inner city uh, places about the planet. I asked him to investigate uh, who was uh, Abdur Rahman and what was the organization uh, to which he was associated. And so he said, I asked a couple of former Columbia students who are now based in Cairo, who follow Islamist uh, politics and write for Islam Online, and they both hadn't heard of this website. They did some research, and it turns out to be a Salashi website, given the names of the scholars on the masthead, mostly Egyptian, but also some Saudi sheikhs. And while the Arabic website is more organized than the English version, it is just as outrageous. Inane stories about how the Charlie Hebdo tragedy was a boon to Islam in that it sparked a wave of conversions. Well, that is of course no doubt true. Regards. So, <clears throat> I decided that I would share uh, this interview because in fact he asks questions about the reasons for writing the, the, the book, God's Crucible, uh, and uh, the uh, reasons why uh, this collaboration uh, is, is uh, meaningful uh, today and why his own world should be more aware of it. And so it begins, he says, Al-Andalus was the Arabic name given to a nation and territorial region also commonly referred to as Moorish Iberia. The name describes parts of the Iberian Peninsula and Septimania governed by Muslims given the generic name of Moors at various times in the period between 711 and 1492. 
says he. He asks, God's crucible is Pulitzer Prize winning scholar David Levering Lewis's contribution to the ever-growing body of literature that seeks a better understanding of Islam and the roots of its long and complicated struggle with the West. Unlike other scholars of Islamic and Middle Eastern history who have dashed off books in the wake of September 11, what would you add? And I say, for a historian, thinking about the present means thinking about the past and the present. And I believe, it seemed to me that we in the West were imposing the problems of the present upon the past as the tensions with some parts of the Muslim world became worse in the years before September 11. The more general problem of agnosticism about the historic interaction of Islam and the Occident had been compounded in America by the Hunt Huntingtonian thesis of civilizational clash and the ascendancy of neoconservative scholarship and policy agendas clamorously asserting an oil and water incompatibility of the culture of the West and that of the Muslim world. In this conception of the Muslim problem of what went wrong in Bernard Lewis's famous interrogation, Muslim retrogression into radical religious fundamentalism and political terrorism is stipulated as having been inevitable. My book attempts to place the present at the service of history as it really was. Question. God's crucible refers to Al-Andalus or Muslim Spain as the site of the first clash of civilizations between Islam and the Christian West. What about coexistence between Islam and Christianity in Al-Andalus, he asks. And I say, yes, although your point is well taken, that Christians and Muslims eventually became fiercely antagonistic, the dominant ethos in Al-Andalus was one of religious tolerance and socio-political cooperation from the beginning of the Muslim conquest in the 8th century until the capture of the city of Toledo in 1085. But even after the fall of Toledo, the distinctive religious and social collaboration, what was called the Convivencia, continued here and there in Al-Andalus for almost another century. Let me mention two outstanding examples of this so-called convivencia or collaboration. First, Muslim, Jewish, and Christian scholars worked together in Toledo, Cordoba, and Barcelona to interpret and translate scientific and philosophical texts from Greek and Arabic into Latin until the end of the 12th century. It was their translations of commentaries of Plato, Aristotle, Euclid, many by Ali ibn Sina, ibn Sina, and many others that found their way over the Pyrenees into Paris, Frankfurt, Florence, and Rome, where they sowed the seeds of the European Renaissance beginning in the 14th century. Second, let's take the example of King Ferdinand III, who was buried in 1252 in a tomb inscribed in four languages, Arabic, Hebrew, Latin, Castilian. Question, the central argument of this book is that the Islamic civilization of Andalus contributed directly to the rebirth of Western European culture and learning. How did you find Al-Andalus? You're right. This is one of the book's main arguments. This is what I was just beginning to talk about. The reality is that with little fear of exaggeration, we might say that Muslim Al-Andalusia served as Christian Europe's madrasa. The entire surviving Andal uh, body of ancient Greek and Roman learning was translated, interpreted, revised, and transmitted to Christian Europe by Muslim and Jewish <coughs> scholars in Abbasid, Baghdad, and Umayyad, Cordoba, and Toledo. In recent years, some European scholars have denied the importance of the Arab contribution to the so-called Renaissance. A surprisingly influential book by a Frenchman, 
one Sylvain Guggenheim, claims that Al-Andalus had nothing to do with the revival of learning that science and, and philosophy and of, that science <clears throat> and philosophy of classical antiquity was brought to Europe by Syriac Christian monks from the Middle East. Preposterous claims such as these have been taken seriously in parts of Europe since 9-11. How did Islam arising inspire cultural pride in hitherto marginalized Arab tribes? In the blink of an eye, <clears throat> so to speak, the universal message of Islam superseded the old Arab tribal loyalty of the Yahaliya, the people of the Najd, and of the Hajjaz, who had long lived in the shadow of great Roman and Persian empires, became the bearers of God's latest and final revelation, Abraham's most favorite peoples. They themselves were astonished by the unparalleled success of their obligation to spread the message of the Prophet Muhammad. After all, in less than a hundred years after the messenger's death, undivided by tribe and united by religion, the Arab peoples had swept aside the Persians, the Greco-Romans, and extended the Dar al-Islam, the House of Islam, west across the Maghreb to the Iberian Peninsula and east almost as far as China. Arabic became the lingua franca spoken by, by Persians, Egyptians, Berbers. The Mediterranean was no longer the Roman Mare Nostrum, but the Arab Sea. Question, Muslims ruled in Al-Andalus, forging a religiously tolerant, intellectually sophisticated, socially diverse, and economically dynamic culture whose achievements would eventually seed the Renaissance. Could you elaborate on that statement? Well, to a great extent, I've already tried to do so. Ask your audience to imagine themselves visiting the great Umayyad city of Cordoba in the 10th century the largest city on the <coughs> European continent, much larger than Paris or Rome of the day. By then, the Abbasid's discovery of the Chinese formula for paper making had come to Al-Andalus, <coughs> where the great library of Cordoba held some 300,000 paper volumes, nothing like it in any Christian monastery or abbey. Cordoba's great mosque, finished by the Amir Abd al-Rahman I in 778, was and still is one of the jewels of world architecture. The city streets were lighted at night. The city abounded in public baths and inns. The trade and commerce of the city's business class encompassed Sahara gold, Chinese silk, Indian ivory, Egyptian and Tunisian grain, and much more. But the visitors would undoubtedly be amazed by the new palace city built just outside Cordoba <clears throat> by Abd al-Rahman III, the first official caliph of Al-Andalus. Madinat al-Zara, the city of Zara, and Zara either refers to <clears throat> uh, the mistress of the uh, caliph or a flower. Uh, the first official caliph of Madinat al-Zara was the grandest palace on the continent. So splendid that a visiting German nun, uh, Roswitha, if one remembers her, marveled that the Caliph's palace and his city were the ornament of the world. Madinat al-Zara lies in ruins today. Its still impressive remains are being excavated by UNESCO with additional funding. I wrote at the time, uh, said at the time from the Syrian government, I suspect that subsidy has somewhat declined. <laughs> Your visitors can get some idea of the splendor of Madinat al-Zara if they imagine a complex larger than Versailles with gardens and fountains as spectacular. But Cordoba, if the biggest and most impressive city, had significant rivals in Al-Andalus, Toledo, to which Christian monks came to study Aristotle, Euclid, and the revolutionary new Hindu or Arab numbers, Sevilla, Valencia, Zaragoza and fabulous Granada. You clear-sightedly lay out the strengths and weaknesses of both worlds, through your, though your sympathies are clearly with cosmopolitan doctor philosophers like Ibn Rushd and Musa Ibn Maimun, 
better known in the West as Averroes and Maimonides, who represented cultural eclecticism and creedal forbearance, sadly out of place in the increasingly uh, fanatical 12th century. Could you elaborate? Ibn Rushd may be recovering uh, his lost importance in the Muslim intellectual tradition today. I think not now. He was one of those rare thinkers who tried to resume a theological debate that had ended in Islam in, let's say, the 10th century between theological absolutists and relativists. The absolutists, or Asherites, who uh, had defeated the relativists, or Mutazilites. And the window of such debate, of Ishtihad, is said to have been shut permanently by the Caliph al Qadir in about 998. This is the Reformation that many scholars have recaptured as a moment very much like the moment in Europe uh, in the 14th and 15th centuries. Uh, <clears throat> which produced uh, the Enlightenment. Uh, it was vigorous. Uh, it raised all the issues of relativism, uh, <clears throat> of absolutism, uh, of truth uh, that uh, you would expect, and then uh, became uh, uh, for forbidden by edict. <clears throat> Ibn Rushd, highly educated in law and medicine, a member of Cordoba's aristocracy, his grandfather was Hajib, or judge of one of the last Umayyad caliphs. Ibn Rushd was 21 years old when the al murahidin or the al uh, uh Berbers, invaded Al-Andalus in order to fight the Christian armies that were pushing the Muslims out of Al-Andalusia. He dared to match his intellect with that of the great philosopher Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. To that fundamental question, hotly debated by the Asherites and Mutazilites, as to whether the Quran was eternal or created in time, Ibn Rushd affirmed the latter. For Ibn Rushd, re revelation and reason were co-equal. Even though his ideas were denounced by Muslims and Christians, his brilliant writings on Aristotle gained him powerful converts among French and Italian thinkers. Even more surprising, the Berber Caliph, that is the al muad Caliph, uh, presiding over from Morocco, uh, what was left of Muslim Spain, <coughs> from Marrakesh, um, the Berber Caliph summoned Ibn, Ibn Rushd to Averroes as a protected advisor to his court at Marrakesh. But when the Christian armies began winning battles against again in Al-Andalus, Ibn Rushd's heterodox ideas made him too great a liability. The Caliph exiled him and ordered his writings burnt in public. He died disgraced in Cordoba in 1198. Maimonides was born in Cordoba nine years younger than uh, Ibn Rushd, whom he may personally uh, have known when their families lived in the coastal city of Almeria while on the run from the invading Almohads. Maimonides' family were Arabized Jews or Sarfadim who served like Ibn Rushd's as senior advisors in the Umayyad regime. Indeed, Moses Maimonides, or Musa ibn Maimun, was for all intents and distinctions part of the Arab elite, an intellectual who wrote all but one of his major works in Arabic. He was really a superb example of the convivencia that distinguished Al-Andalus at its finest. But the coming of the Muslim Berbers First, the Sanhaja, al Moravids, and then the uh, al Moads, or Masmudas Berbers, in 1147, radically altered the political and religious ethos of Andalusia. These fierce fighting men came to help the sophisticated Andalusi rulers of Granada, Sevilla, and Zaragoza 
whose people had grown too comfortable and civilized to stop the Christian Jihad. The coming of the Almohads was especially unfortunate for Andalusia's Jews because the Almohads disregarded the Quranic injunction that none should be forced to convert to Islam, as well as the faith's historic tolerance of people of the book, the Dini. For Musa ibn Mamun, the Almohads meant the ruin of his faith in convivencia and the realization of his destiny as Maimonides, the great intellect of Sephardic Iberia and Judaism. Both these extraordinary minds, Ibn Rushd, Avareos, and Maimonides, Maimun, became anachronisms in a world energized by two hostile monotheisms, militant Islam and militant Catholic Christianity. As men of culture and principles, they came to be seen by their contemporaries as liabilities at best and dangerous subversives at worst. The awful bitter irony of it all was that the two humanists died beleaguered as the finest incarnations of their civilization, representative heirs of a social and political order that was unique to Muslim Spain. What was Islam's role in the history of Europe? Well, in addition to what we've discussed thus far, I think we can state that the existence of Muslim wealth and power on the continent, the 700-year Islamic beachhead behind the Pyrenees, decisively shaped what emerged as Christendom. Europe was shaped in a passive way by the Muslim reinforcement and transfer of classical learning that seeded the Renaissance. Europe was shaped in an active way, um, <clears throat> I suppose we could say, by the secular institutions that rose up offensively, defensively, to counter real and imagined threats of Islamic absorption. The Frankish kingdom of Charlemagne, the kinglets of northern Iberia, Leon, Castile, Galicia, the political and cultural blowback of the Crusades, and to the mix, add to the mix, the militarization or the militarizing of the Catholic religion during the wars of ethnic cleansing against the pagan Saxon people conducted by Charlemagne, another chapter in history that needs to be uh, incorporated in the larger narrative. Add further, therefore, the emergence of an all-powerful papacy in command of an organized priesthood which commanded the faithful beneath it. Fair to say, Europeans spent the centuries from Salah al-Din, Saladin, uh, who gave, uh, who gave uh, shelter to Maimonides, to Suleiman, the lawgiver, worrying about Moors and Saracens. Uh, you are at your best here, your love for the culture of Andalusian Spain and your appreciation for uh, the Arab culture. Could you elaborate on that statement? It, it may well be that the reality of demographic rather than the surahs or of the Quran explain the distinctive religious tolerance practiced by Muslims in Spain. During the first century of the conquest of Iberia, Muslims <coughs> were like schools of fish in a sea of Christians, some tens of thousands among some six million others. It surely made sense to, ten, uh, to practice restraint and not unduly provoke resistance from the natives. Nor should it be surprising that Umayyads made strategic use of the Jews, a people who welcomed the Arabs as saviors from the Visigoths. Uh, brutal policy of forced religious conversion and property <coughs> expropriation. That said, however, what may have started out as a policy based on numbers soon became a civilization based on hierarchical collaboration. Muslims always ruled from a position of unassailable power and privilege to be sure. They imposed legal restrictions on the dhimmi Restrict, um, restricted the building of churches, the public display of Christian and Jewish ceremonies, 
ban the use of swords and saddles to non-Muslims. They imposed a dress code. Al-Andalus was not a society where all men were equal, to say nothing of women. Still, these legal and sumptuary codes, the sharp and harsh social distinctions, did moderate over time. Remarkably then, 200 years after Tariq ibn Ziyad and his 700 Berbers invaded, uh, in, uh, Berber invaders sailed from Morocco in 710, the population of, Al, of, Al, <coughs> of Iberia had become almost 70% Muslim through conversion. By the 11th century, Andalusian society could be said to have achieved an urban cosmopolitanism, commercial dynamism, meritocratic public service, and interconnectedness of its ethnic and religious parts as to prefigure the cultural pluralism, the very modernity characteristic of much of late 20th century Northern Europe. Uh, could you elaborate on the stark differences between Dark Age Europe and Al-Andalus? Sure, Al-Andalus had a monetized market economy based on global trade and domestic agriculture supplying urban centers. City mores prevailed. It had a cosmopolitanism nourished by Quranic uh, literacy. Germanic Europe was uh, an economy decoupled from the great trade mat matrix stretching from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Societal organization based itself on uh, that of Christian Europe, based itself on a rigid three-four class system in which a ruling order of hereditary warriors protected a subservient order of merchants and peasants whose spiritual needs were served by a priestly order with the exclusive power to intercede between believers and their God, and doing so, moreover, in a language that mostly the illiterate faithful could neither understand nor read. Why did you begin your book at the date 610? And a reader finds uh, um, looks to me like something was dropped from there because, of course, um, yeah, I, I missed that when I was reading the why he uh, gave the date of 610. Uh, did you mean to ask why I, ah, and I correct, oh, did you mean to ask why I begin my book at 570, uh, the date of the birth of, of Muhammad? Yes. In discussing the Prophet's views on women, how did Prophet Muhammad's comparatively enlightened ideas as explained by Allah about gender roles positively distinguish the Quran from its misogynistic, misogynistic mosaic and Pauline, Pauline analogs? Well, I say, the Quranic guarantees of property rights for women uh, were, in comparison with the relevant Judaic and Christian scriptures, benign and more advanced. What would you like to tell some readers who said, Lewis repeats the standard cliches about the authoritarian Pope Innocent III and his stipulations that Jews and Muslims dwelling in Christendom should be set apart with distinctive garb. I would reply that the standard cliches are sometimes true, that in the case of Innocent III and the ramifications of the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215, the cliches apply incontrovertibly. I'm happy to find myself in the company of the American Catholic historian James Carroll. I'll quote from a review by Tim Rutten, Los Angeles Times. It says, Lewis sets out to show that the failure of what he calls the jihad of the uh, east of the Pyrenees is one of the most significant losses in world history. Uh, he's quoting this, uh, this reviewer. He argues that the, in other words, the West would have been better off if it had been incorporated into an all-conquering Islamic empire in the early Middle Ages. Uh, how can you prove that? I am not an advocate of military conquest of one people by another. I was merely calling attention to the much ignored probability that Islam's remarkable accomplishments in Iberia would have been replicated east of the Pyrenees had the Arabo-Berber incursions continued after 
the Battle of Poitiers, in that famous date of 732. What about Arab civilization on the Iberian Peninsula, known as Al-Andalus? Forgive me, but I do believe I've said enough to give a pretty vivid, accurate picture of Andalusian civilization before the conquest of Granada. I wish I might also add that your audience might want to read my book, God's Crucible. Perhaps there is an Egyptian publishing house that would care to publish the Arabic edition. You said that Europe would have been well served if the Muslims had conquered the entire continent and added that this would have given Europe a 300 year head start on the path of development. What do you say to writers such as David Price Jones who offer up a, uh, who offer up a recycled British political view of the Oriental mind from the Victorian era and Bat Yeor in Eurabia chronicles uh, uh, who chronicles Arab determination to subdue Europe as a cultural appendage of the Muslim world. What I wrote about the technological, economic, institutional benefits of a Muslim advance beyond the Pyrenees has been much misunderstood to mean that I wanted France, Germany, Italy, and the rest swept aside in the 8th century by a jihad. Of course, such uh, notions, uh, of course, uh, no such nations then existed, and the very concept of European was yet to come as a reaction to the Moors. Remember, after all, that after the collapse of the Western Roman Empire and the primitive efforts of the Germanic tribes, there was little that merited the description of civilization. Finally, my book ends almost 250 years before the Ottomans capture Constantinople and a Europe of well-developed nation states uh, ready to resist Islam. He says, thank you very much. <laughs> I think uh, I would now invite uh, questions uh, that I didn't answer my interlocutor, uh, Abdul Rahman, or questions that you think are unanswerable. <laughs> Sir. Uh, do you have a link? Is this interview still live somewhere? It's, yes, it is uh, alive in, uh, in, in Egypt on something called uh, Alukanet, A-L-U-K-A-H dot N-E-T, a Salafist uh, website. Okay. Right. Uh, like most people here, probably, I know more history before 570 <laughs> and after 1215, the, the, in order to make your information um, more uh, something that we can better handle and tap into, I noticed that Reza Oslin has a credit for you on the front of your book that says a magisterial work of one of America's great historians. Do you know Reza Oslin? I do know Reza Aslan. Uh, I know him personally, and I had the uh, pleasure of bringing him to uh, NYU's new output, outpost <coughs> uh, at, uh, uh, in the Persian Gulf, uh, in Abu Dhabi, NYU Abu Dhabi. And uh, there he came. Uh, we have a, a lecture series, rather like Shemmel, uh, going on in uh, downtown Abu Dhabi. Uh, and uh, uh, he came to talk about uh, his book, uh, which was uh, quite uh, uh, profitable to, to me in the early stages of, of writing. Uh, he was then, in fact, uh, thinking about the book that has been quite successful, uh, and that is the recovery of the participants in, uh, in Jesus's circle who have not been sufficiently uh, profiled. It is that, that isn't the book Zealot, is it? Yes. Well, I, I found that rather fanciful history. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the sense that he, he uh, takes a very creative approach to the early church. He, 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 he puts Peter in a place 
greater than Paul. He, he says of Paul, essentially, that Paul's an outlier and puts them both under James, brother of Jesus. Now, that's certainly a good deal before the period. I thought maybe he would be better with the period you're doing. But, but what did you find about Zealot? That, that? Uh, as a matter of fact, I've not read Zealot. Uh, uh, he talked, he, he talked uh, uh, impulsively about it uh, at dinner. But he had been invited by me to talk about his book on Islam. Uh, and there I, I, I find that it's, uh, it, it is useful. There are many uh, <clears throat> Muslims who think that it is a bit fanciful, as you say, uh, that uh, its documentation seems to be more inferential than hard, uh, especially his comments on what happens to women uh, in Islam early days, given the fact that mutatis mutandis, the time in which we're talking, um, Islam uh, privileged the role of women in a way that had uh, that role continued, we would have a very different relationship. Uh, he, Reza Aslan, would blame, I think, and this is, I'm reaching back to my memory, uh, he would blame the second caliph, Umar, who seems to have been a bully and a misogynist, uh, but he would also uh, uh, lay at the foot of uh, Fatima uh, some responsibility. Uh, as she uh, foisted interpretations about uh, sexual conduct for reasons that are rather complicated, I gather, in that she, she may have been protesting too much uh, her own purity. Uh, and in any case, uh, her justification of stoning and that sort of thing was not a part of uh, the Quran at all, uh, but has become part of the uh, hadith uh, uh, that are credited. Before I let you go, Aslan was a Muslim who has become a Christian? So who was? I'm sorry. I oh, oh, pardon me. Was a Muslim, is still a Muslim? Then I didn't hear the name though. Who? Aslan. Oh, oh, oh Reza oh. Aslan uh, is a, uh, is a, 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 an Iranian uh, a, a, with, with, uh, what, the Arabs believe the, the Iranians can't be trusted for scholarship about uh, Islam. I just to add that. But he is a, a very cosmopolitan uh, Iranian. And I don't know that he was ever a, a Christian. I don't think so. Yes. What is your uh, prognosis of um, the spread of uh, fundamentalism in the uh, world community? In the world community? Well, it's a, it's pretty vexing. You, you mean, uh, you watching the recent uh, uh, c campaign debates? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm looking at the Middle East. Yes. Um, I, to, to, to over, in, in the current issue of the New York Review, there is a, a very uh, brutal appreciation of uh, a uh, woman uh, uh, who is a revisionist and a, for, a reformist, uh, Aya Hirsan Ali. And Max Rodenbeck says in this very long review that she knows nothing about Islam. She doesn't understand it. Uh, her argument is that, uh, that the early uh, surahs or chapters of the, of the total 114 that were enunciated in Mecca uh, reflect the genuine spirit uh, of the prophet and of the book. But that the 14 or so, or maybe 18, my math could be wrong, that were enunciated in Yathrib or Medina and are really hard-nosed uh, are less representative. And that Muslims should, going back to that book, uh, be more inspired by uh, uh, the, the soft Islam than the hard-boiled Islam of the second. You can see how problematic that, that, that would just be on its, on its face. But he takes her to task and he says, this is not a problem. Um, <clears throat> fundamentalism is always there and it rises or falls depending on other things that have to do with economics and politics and geopolitics. And uh, she uh, misses, misses that point. Well, I, I think Rodenbeck is right, although I think uh, the Quran is especially uh, 
vulnerable to misrepresent misinterpretation, it seems to me. All scripture is, because it's all very pliable. But I think you can cherry pick and justify jihad quite readily. But that's really not the problem. The problem is geopolitics and, uh, and, and jobs. That is, throughout the Fertile uh, Crescent, you have had generations of men and women who are uh, fairly well educated, could be better educated, and in any case, however educated they are, can't find jobs. Uh, and you have states that have uh, appropriated their funds for uh, hardware from the Pentagon uh, or from uh, Russia uh, and uh, who are corrupt. Uh, and that situation is problematic for the people directly affected. But it becomes our problem when we do something that destabilizes an entire region. And so we have then the Bush invasion of Iraq, which is the blowback that we now experience in the 10th arrondissement in Paris. We cause this. And uh, we are not obliged, of course, to humble ourselves and say we did it. But it is historically useful from the point of view of ultimate policy the derivation to, to recognize this. Now, what's the destabilization? It is that, for better or worse, the people who were running the show <clears throat> did have our values. They had the values of Dick Cheney, uh, as well as the values of Joe Biden. That is to say, uh, they believed in literacy, they believed in business, uh, they, they believed uh, in uh, civility, uh, that sort of thing. That whole tier in the Muslim world now has been uh, not only destabilized, but it has been uh, uh, invalidated. And so you cannot expect in any of these countries the appeal of the power holders of the past to have any traction now. There are exceptions. Morocco is a tight ship and uh, it, uh, it, it runs well with a huge security apparatus to, to ensure that. And of course a tourism industry that uh, means that uh, uh, that, that limits the parameters of, of excess and Salafism and so on. But, and Algeria as well, which is a horrendous autocracy, but uh, running show. Uh, but elsewhere, uh, people who uh, would retard uh, fundamentalism uh, and uh, barbarism uh, have, no, uh, have, have no, uh, no, no standing at all. Uh, because they are, ipso facto, apologists of the great Satan. You know, uh, we certainly need to stable uh, Syria, and uh, it seems to me there's a, uh, a ground roots uh, movement, the Brotherhood, which is quite old, uh, to uh, turn back the uh, clock uh, on progress. And that seems to be universal in the Middle East. Well, we can't be quite sure if the Brotherhood uh, were still with the Egyptians. We couldn't be quite sure, I think, what its policies would, would really have resulted in. Um, uh, uh, I, I would simply say that. But yes, fundamentalism is, is now uh, a, a, a problem that uh, is, is frightening, and its antidote for us is unfortunately uh, intervention again. A and uh, we can't be sure that that will mitigate the fundamental problem, but we have no choice now uh, because very shortly there will be incidents in American cities that mimic uh, what we are witnessing in, in Paris, that's for sure. Yep. Do you think that will happen? I, I have, I fear it will, no. Sarah. So with the abundant influence that Islam has had on the West, can we justify the use of the term Judeo-Islamo-Christian culture, which would have the salutary effect of bringing Muslims into the family of humanity rather than viewing them as the other? Yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and the literature that has that position is abundant. Uh, it, it, but of course, in, in this climate, this seems to be uh, a, a rather um, 
uh, precious interpretation of possibilities. Yes? Several years ago, uh, Robert Ballard spoke as one of the library uh, speakers. And at the end, people asked him questions. And, and one of the questions that he had interpreted was, what can we do to protect the Earth? And his answer was, put women in charge. Everybody <laughs> laughed, as you all did. But the point is, it's true. Now, well, yes. <laughs> who, gets, who starts wars? Not women. Mm -hmm. Now. Well, I wouldn't be so sure that if Hillary uh, is elected. <laughs> started by trying to Muhammad started by trying to have women in somewhat of an equal footing and that disappeared because of the strength of men mm -hmm. considering the number the population of women and men is there do you see anything in the future that Islamic women will rise up and say enough is enough well they are doing that uh, with, with great uh, uh, punishment uh, in, in Afghanistan. Right. Uh, yes, but yes, indeed they are. And the, I mean, will the they be successful in any, I mean, I will not live to see it, but do you think they will be successful? Yes, I, I think so. There's a, a book that, uh, that I commend to us all. It's called uh, Women After All. Uh, it's written by an American uh, uh, professor of economics uh, at uh, at the University of Virginia, and I'm sorry I can't remember the name of the title, it's very catchy. And uh, he combines both genetics uh, and uh, demographics uh, to be very hopeful about the uh, rise of, uh, of women uh, and what is happening in our society. I mean, if you were to ask this question uh, confined to the United States, it's obvious that the difference now is a difference of, of earning. Uh, of 25% of, of less income for the same work. Well, that is passing. That has to pass. Uh, you look at the graduation rates in all the professional schools, and so we have an anomaly now where women are doing the work of the mind as well as of science, uh, but denied perhaps full compensation. Well, that will change. It, it simply will have to change. And uh, uh, also, the definition of, of, um, of gender uh, advances here uh, in ways that um, <clears throat> uh, make it uh, not a, uh, a, 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 an ideal model to play to your testosterone, uh, that men uh, have to accept roles that uh, in previous decades would have been described as the feminization of the culture. Well, feminization of the culture is, is inevitable. Uh, we are perhaps ahead of uh, many societies, not though the Scandinavians for sure. Um, <clears throat> and this is the great fear in the Uma of undereducated males. Uh, it's like race in America used to be. You at least have your pigment. You're at least white. Uh, you can hold on to that. Uh, and uh, e even if you, uh, your education and your uh, professional opportunities are not, not great, in the, the Yuma, it's that uh, we can at least hold on to our gonads. Uh, and, we, uh, and so the idea of women becoming literate uh, is, uh, is resisted ferociously. Uh, uh, if the caliph wins, uh, then, of course, uh, the progress will be uh, uh, annulled. Uh, but I think it's unlikely that, say, uh, five years from now, we'll be dealing with uh, al-Baghdadi and Raqqa, the caliphate. Uh, that, uh, that, that, because it's simply uh, not something we can, uh, we can permit. Uh, okay. right. Professor Lewis. Mm. Significance of Judaism during the time period you wrote. What was the significance of Judaism during the time period you wrote this? Yes, um, it, it, its significance is, uh, is is quite considerable. Um, uh, much of the uh, the translation work 
uh, was done by, uh, uh, by Sephardim. Um, and um, during the 10th century and the 10th and 11th century, which is the, the, the great century for uh, 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 Jews in, in Iberia, um, uh, many uh, uh, enjoyed roles of influence and power uh, that were uh, quite considerable. Uh, I'm trying to think of the um, <clears throat> example uh, of the um, famous um, uh, Jewish leader uh, who commanded troops against Muslim armies uh, in, uh, uh, in the region that uh, produces uh, Alhambra. Uh, somewhat it mimicked uh, the, uh, the court Jews of, 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 uh, of, of, uh, of Europe uh, who were moneylenders, uh, who uh, provided uh, judicial advice and that sort of thing. And so that was true uh, in, uh, in, in, in Spain. Um, the backlash comes uh, <clears throat> uh, in, after Toledo, uh, and uh, it, it is because the Jewish community is vilified as having supported the uh, establishment of Islam in Spain and continuing to support uh, the role of, uh, of, a, uh, of a Muslim supremacy at a time when armies are marching south from uh, the north uh, to, uh, to, to depress and expel and collaborate. It's a very fuzzy picture, uh, exemplified best, I suppose, by El Cid, who was a hired, uh, a hired sword sometimes for the Muslims, sometimes for the Christians, and much of the time also uh, a, um, a good friend of, uh, of, of Jews. I, I should mention that, that uh, Rosa Menacol's uh, the ornament of, uh, of the universe is wonderful at capturing the uh, full participation of the Jewish community over time in, in Spain. I just wanted to make a comment. I was in uh, Cordoba in 2002. I visited the Grand Mosque that was there. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, I don't think you mentioned this, but in the middle of that mosque, they've actually cons they constructed a church with a big uh, dome in the middle. And yes. And it's sort of an interesting metaphor for, for your talk here. Um, Islam and Christians come in one building. It's actually the same building. Mm -hmm. I think that it was constructed later, but I just want to yes. It, yes, that, that's a, a mixed bag, isn't it? Because you might say it does exemplify the, the, the mixture of, of the cultures, uh, but it's also a, an architectural ruination. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and uh, Carlos V, the emperor, denies that he had any uh, permission uh, uh, when, when that happened, I was involved in it. Uh, 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 yes, that, uh, that's great pity. Uh, I, I was saying on the elevator that uh, when I was uh, in Spain uh, writing this book, uh, the Spanish government seriously was considering uh, Friday Muslim services uh, in the Cordoba Mosque. It seemed to be appropriate. It was a grand uh, reach out to the community, and of course that is no longer a feasible consideration. Too bad. <laughs> Thank you. to thank uh, Dr. Lewis for taking us back from a place that we maybe don't want to be in right now and learning more about uh, the richness of history and the opportunities and challenges of other centuries. So what we have our own now, and um, he's referred to those two. We thank you so much. And we have one more um, program. We have a program on Monday night some of you have signed up for. It's a briefing on the refugee situation uh, in uh, Europe, and uh, it's at 5.30 at Naples, I believe. I'm not sure of that. 
Emily will know. Anyway, perhaps we'll see you there, and then you'll just wait until the new brochure is out. We're getting that ready. It will go out. Um, it'll be taking a step forward with the graphic designer tomorrow. So stay tuned. Thank you.